Hi, my name is Aidan O'Shea. I'm uh, one of the directors of the Lingua Viva Centre uh, Language School on Leeson Street in Dublin. Uh, Aidan, I want to start by asking you about the challenges that the pandemic has posed in your school and in your classrooms there. Yeah, well, I suppose like all language schools, we taught our last class uh, before the pandemic on the, the 13th of March. And uh, ironically, it was the 13th of um, October when we reopened. So we were we were closed for physical classes for a full seven months. Um, I suppose the initial challenge caused by the pandemic was flipping at very short notice onto uh, online classes, um, you know, in the space of 48 hours now. Uh, we were lucky enough that we had some guidance from um, from Quality English that they developed in relation to online classes and um, online class charters and best practice for for teaching and for for syllabus and so on. So that was probably the first challenge that we faced. Um, and then I suppose the second challenge once we had got the online classes up and running was the the back end support. You know the admin, the uh, student support. Um, applications for um you know letters that students need social programs um you know moving all of that from a face-to-face -face provision online and um, so they were kind of the two initial hurdles that we had to overcome at the very early stages of the the pandemic and um, as it went on i suppose and as we all realized that this wasn't something that was going to go away in two or three weeks or even two or three months and um, the the next hurdle for us was um, well, how do we how do we deal with this in you know not just in an emergency form for two or three weeks, but how do we make this the new norm? Um, and that was you know adapting everything that we do, kind of becoming if you like an, an online school, um, for, you know for a substantial period of time. Um, training has been has been a huge part of it, um, and getting lots and lots of feedback. So we surveyed our students regularly, uh, our staff. Um, and then as we decided on a reopening date in, in October, now we, we probably reopened later than many schools because we I suppose, wanted to get it right. Um, we surveyed extensively our staff, our students, and what, they, what their priorities were for going back to face-to-face -to -face classes from the point of view of safety, from the point of view of resources. Um, and then once we decided we'd go back, uh, again, training our staff, moving all of our um, moving all of our placement tests online um, and then trying to implement um, the COVID policies as they became available to us from, from the range of government bodies. So it's, uh, I think the, the, the main problem from, for all schools, I don't think I speak, you know, just for our school here was the, the lack of clarity. And, um, you know, we really didn't know um, which, A, under whose auspices we fell, you know, we were, we were dealing with um, uh, Department of Education. We were dealing with newly formed departments. You know, there was everyone forgets there was an election and new departments. You know, in the, at the start of this pandemic, um, and then just trying to uh, trying to agree on a set established protocol um, for everything from online to to reopening. Um, so that's been that's been a frustration. Um, you know, just when you thought you had, you know, everything something as simple as you know two meters or one meter distance or 1.5 or masks or visors. So it's the constant movable feast. And um, so we've just had to be adaptable. Um, and I think the, the best way to do that has just been to set our own standards, you know, to take in all of the standards available by government bodies. And um, as I said, we work with Quality English, we've worked with, you know, the MEI have had theirs available. I think you need to set your own standards that you're comfortable with that cover all of the statutory guidelines and then, uh, train up your staff, go with them, and then, you know, implement and enforce them. And so far it's worked. Um, we reopened physically for eight days and then we were back online. You know, again, that's just, that's just the way 2020 has been. But I think we were all really happy with those eight days um, because we got to, to test out the systems that we had, you know, spent months planning. Um, and we now know that when we next go back face to face, that we were very happy with the, um, the physical layout of the school and the, the structures and the procedures that we put in place, they all worked well, albeit for, for eight days, but we now know that um, we can confidently reopen again when we're, when we're told it's safe to do so. And from the feedback that you, you were collecting as you went along from the students, from the staff, um, what uh, kind of things were they telling you that 
influence the form that that eventually took, whether it's academically or in terms of health and safety or general welfare. Yeah, um, I suppose the first thing we focused on was the the health and safety. Given you know this this is a this is a a health crisis that we're in. So, um, you know, we've we pride ourselves on having good access to things like computer rooms, libraries, student rooms. We have a lovely outdoor area at the back and, you know, students use that. And we also have low numbers in our classes. So we had to tell the students, look, if we're going to go back here face to face, we're going to have to sacrifice a lot of our common areas. You know, are you happy to come back where, you know, you won't be able to congregate on the breaks? You won't be able to congregate um, outside classes where, you know, you won't have access to a computer room or our libraries and so on. Um, and students were, were aware of that and happy, I suppose, to make those sacrifices if it meant they could get back in a classroom with, you know, with their teachers, with their classmates. So the priority, first and foremost, was health and safety. Um, from an academic provision point of view, um, we looked at, um, you know, we... I suppose we stopped recruiting um, for quite a while once the pandemic hit because you know, we didn't know exactly how long it would, it would take. So once we knew we were going to reopen, we started to recruit new students again in the lead up to that phase. So we had quite a lot of new students and invariably you've got quite a broad spectrum of levels. So we made the decision early on that we would continue to um, provide all, all levels, even down to you know, A1 for students um, even if it meant one or two in a class, because that's what the feedback from students was. They, they didn't want to end up in, um, you know, classes where you had maybe an A1, A2 blend because, it, you know, it made more sense economically or it made more sense when they were online. So what we ended up doing is actually having more classes face to face than we had online because, well, A for, for social distancing, but B because we were getting a broader spectrum of, of levels. Um, and we canvassed the students in advance of that. And again, they were happier to, to be, um, you know, at, in a more defined level um, than maybe they, they would have been online. Most of the students' concerns were around health and safety. You know, were they happy to wear a mask for three, four hours a day? Um, were they happy that, you know, a lot of the things that they really enjoyed in the class previously may not be able to, to happen, such as, you know, really, you know, intensive pair work and group work. So, we prepare them a lot for kind of the pedagogic changes that would be there. Um, and I think saying that to them in advance and giving them the option to, to maybe continue some of those aspects online and um, through our virtual learning platform kind of softened the blow of the fact that you now they couldn't do, you know, the, the really close, you know, two or three in a, in a pod and kind of pair work that they, that they were quite used to. So, um, but again, I think just telling the students in advance, telling them what to expect, what was coming rather than them arriving in first day. We moved all of our induction again online. Um, and we, again, moving our placement tests online allowed us to de then do the induction and um, right up to even doing some um, video tours, live video tours with new students to walk them around the building. Um, I think, um, showing them the story and um, I'd looked at what the HSE did actually for for um, children who were yet to get the test you know to get their their COVID test and they had a really interesting story of the day where they showed the students well you know you'll arrive at the building and somebody will meet you like this and it's a very strange looking building because everybody's in PPE but we kind of took a similar approach where we you know the students were used to seeing the school under normal conditions and we kind of didn't want them to be shocked you know eight seven eight months later whereas covered in stickers and signs and the desks were different and there was barriers up. So we kind of brought them through a video tour of the school to show them you'll arrive here, stay to the left hand side of the stairs. Um, you know, this is your teacher zone, which you know you shouldn't be going into. And normally you go to the office, but can you please email us instead? So I think showing them in advance what the building looked like, how the layout had changed, you know, made their adaptation to arriving into the building a lot easier. You mentioned having A1 students and when it's all change and new procedures and new ways of doing things and new information, that must really have been a challenge for them. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we're lucky we've got quite a multilingual staff. Um, so, you know, we do have the main, the main languages covered. So we were able to, again, through the online inductions and kind of Zoom supports. Uh, but again, the visuals worked really well with, with A1 learners. 
uh, particularly in the area, as I said, of health and safety. But um, it's it's always a challenge, I think, even under normal conditions, you know, doing proper inductions with A1 students because there's such a mountain of information anyway for them arriving into a new country and, um, uh, you know, everything from getting registered with immigration to finding accommodation and all of the all of the paperwork that goes with it. So it, it's, it's, it's a challenge at the best of times. Uh, but again, we took advantage, I guess, of having a good lead in time and I think giving ourselves the lead in time. We could have reopened in August or September. We waited until October just so we could work through all of these issues in advance and kind of think about them in advance. So we gave ourselves plenty of time. We knew we had A1 students coming in. So we knew that we had two or three weeks in which to, to integrate them in and for them to meet us all online and get their documents set up and get their appointments set up so that when they did join our classes, they could just concentrate on the classes. You don't always have that luxury when you're in a busy period, you know, in a face-to-face -face language school where, you know, you're, you're processing, you know, larger number of students and you're doing inductions and placement tests on a Monday. So one of the benefits, I think, of us, we have a smaller student population now. So, um, you know, we never had a huge student population, anyway, but it's smaller than usual. Um, so you just get to spend more time with the students and you get to spend more time, especially in advance of their arrival. So that's that's certainly helped. And apart from using Zoom and this kind of, uh, you know, technical tools and all of that, what would you say you've learned along the way as an organization or even uh, yourself uh, as a professional? Yeah, I mean, it, it has been, it's been really interesting. It's been, you know, it's a good way to kind of, I think, reassess your kind of core values as a school, you know, what is it that we do? What is it that we don't do? Um, I think we've certainly, um, what we, you know, what we keep on saying at our, our, our staff training every week is that we need to set up our school and our systems for the student, give the students every chance to succeed. Um, so I think we've gotten to know our student profile a lot better um, and we've gotten to know their needs and, and I suppose the things that affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, in our most recent kind of feedback from students, we realized that what was stopping them access say our online class at the moment was, wasn't you know, having a good phone or a good laptop or good Wi-Fi. It was that where they're living, there's four or five other people in their apartment with them and they can't find a quiet space to learn or they could have another flatmate in the same room as them in a different school on a different call on a different level and you know so we've we've said to our students for example if you are within five kilometers of us and it's safe to do so and you just you you're you're um where you're doing your class at home isn't working for you you can come into the building we'll, we'll designate a classroom to you you can use our wi-fi use our hardware and access our online classes from the school and um, so i think you know that whole idea of you know setting the students up for success and giving them every chance for success has has kind of become a little mini mantra for us um, since we started back onto the online classes. I think the other thing we've noticed is, um, you know, you spoke about it, you know, there's so much out there now between Zoom and all the different virtual learning environments and the gadgets and so on, and they're great, but um, good teachers in a physical classroom are good teachers in an online classroom. So that the core of, you know, teachers um, preparing suitable classes for students at their level that are challenging and engaging albeit by a different medium, by its very essence is still what we do. And we've worked a lot with our teachers. You know, we, we learned a lot over the, the six or seven months, myself and the other director, Ian, both taught online. We kind of had learned the hard way, you know, what works, what doesn't work. So we worked a lot with the teachers, preparing them for the differences between face-to-face -face and online classes. It's not good enough just to kind of say, we'll do an hour and a half break, hour and a half, and we'll deliver lessons the same way you know, a breakout room doesn't work the same way that, you know, sending students into pair and group work does. So, um, and also, you know, having traditional books on an online class, you know, doesn't make sense. So we've kind of started to reassess, I think, a lot of ways of how we assess students, the, the, what we use to assess them, the materials that we're using. Um, and I think we'll carry a lot of that into our face-to-face -face classes as well. Um, you know, I think, we were always looking at better ways of getting students to produce um, language, whether it be, um, you know, WhatsApp voice notes, uh, video presentations, um, you know, share docs, all of these things. And I think this 
going online has really helped with that, you know, rather than I think the mistake that could have been made was just trying to transfer, as I said, what happens in a face to face class into an online class. So we're trying to avoid that. Um, and I think we're we're trying every week to get this, the teachers feedback on what the students require, because it's, it's a big change for them as well. And um, so I, I don't think you can have enough feedback or enough um, enough training during this this, this whole period. And the last question there is, uh, how do you see it developing in the medium to long term? Ah, oh, the crystal ball. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we've all agreed as soon as we can get back face to face safely, even for a portion of our, our syllabus, we want to. Um, you know, our students came to Ireland and we want them to be, albeit if it's only for a period of the week in class. Um, I definitely think the industry needs to start looking more seriously at blended and flipped learning um, classes done done properly. Um, I think the online, I think we're going to be using online for a while in 2021. I don't know how long, but um, we're certainly looking at hopefully if this quarantine period drops from two weeks to a week or, you know, drops from 14 days to five days, I think we could be looking at initial weeks for students maybe being done online or in a blended format and then building up towards face to face or if students need to be um, self isolating, for example, if they're close contacts, I think there has to be a way of them continuing on in their curriculum online without kind of having to, you know, lose those two weeks. So I think that type of um, adaptation is going to be really essential. Um, in a teaching context as well, I think we're going to be, you know, we're all looking at the moment at quite a small, in Ireland, quite a small pool of students from a very kind of specific demographic. Um, and I think as we head towards the springtime, you know, that demographic will change. And I think traditionally there's always been a change, maybe more short-term students coming in. I think that will be a big challenge because they've got very different needs. Um, you know, to, to students who are here on maybe academic year programs. So I think managing a short-term student's expectations with long-term when you've got, you know, potential zones changing from green to red to orange, I think having lots of flexibility in your system um, and having a lot of adaptation um, in your system is going to be, be crucial. Um, and I think most schools and teachers have responded really well to that because, you know, there, there has been no choice. You know, it's been, it's been an unprecedented year um, but I do think that we should come out of the, the last you know, nine, 10 months, the better for it. But I, I don't think we can go back to kind of the, the old traditional way that things were done, you know, right the way from, you know, recruitment through to the student journey assessment and um, the whole fundamentals of, of, of learning, the whole student support social program. And um, we're going to have to take the best lessons from this if we're going to, um, we're going to make the industry more resilient and and hopefully as well you know it, it produces different revenue streams for schools um you know I, I think you know plenty of schools are dying to get back face to face and you know you can understand why it's it's what they've done since you know they opened their schools but i think i think they'll have to understand as well that you know there there is a market here for different types of programs and there is a, a need i think to to get more creative or modernize uh, programs and um, you know I've been listening and talking to people, you know, developing a virtual learning environment and going online and putting it as a two or three year program. And then in the space of two weeks, people did it and they had to do it. So I think it just goes to show, you know, that it it can be done. But um, I think it has to be thought through now and I think it has to be, well, where does this sit in our suite of offerings? Because it's one thing setting something up at very short notice and it, it's, you know, it doing a job. But I think if it's going to be done properly and if it's going to form an integral part of what you are as a school, then that's fine. But, you know, think it through and, um, and decide where it sits in your, your suite of offerings and um, rather than just, you know, continue doing the, the, the norm, which, which, you know, it won't work. It won't work for 2021. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the genie's out and it's not going back into that bottle. And I also think that the emergency is over. This is now, uh, this is now the, the normal, whatever, whatever that might be. Uh, and so, yeah, we just have to kind of get used to it. Yeah, I mean, as you said, it's, it, it's, you know, it's the five stages of grief, even with it, you know, um, accepting, you know, when we all heard the, 
the the speech as it was, you know, closing the schools on the, the 12th, 13th of March. We all knew it wasn't two weeks at that stage, but we didn't know. I think we all thought maybe we'd get some sort of summer. Summer came and went, and then schools reopened at the end of summer, but, you know, it wasn't the same, re, you know, reopening as before. And then all of these milestones we keep on missing, you know, the, um, the major um, marketing um, fairs in September, October. Um, and I think, you know, we keep on putting these milestones off and off and, you know, and there's a reason why is because, you know, things have changed. Um, we hope 2021 is, is different, but 2021 isn't going to be the exact same as 2019. And, and that's a good thing. You know, it's, it, there's, there's a chance to, to evolve here as schools and, and as an industry um, and to, you know, learn from a lot of the, you know, either the stagnation or the kind of laissez-faire approach that, you know, has, had, had been in the industry for, for a while of just doing the same things and hoping that it's going to, going to stay the same. Um, now is the chance to, you know, in Ireland to maybe to set ourselves, you know, apart from, you know, other competitor markets, whether it be US or Canada or Malta or UK or wherever. But, uh, you know, we haven't even mentioned Brexit, which I think this time last year, we were all saying, you know, we've got to prepare for that. So you know, that's, that's only seven or eight weeks away as well. But um, I think you'd hope that, you know, people aren't just crossing their fingers, thinking things will get back to normal. We all want things to get better, but I think wanting them to get back to normal it seems to indicate wanting them to go back to what they were before and let's hope that they can get you know they can get better and that means that we, they can improve you know and that we can we can all improve and this now has to start a lot of conversations about if online learning is here to stay then let's formalize it let's build it into our quality assurance programs does it form part of a future IEM you know let's get people trained up on it properly does it go into initial teacher training programs um, you know, all of these things need to be thought about because what we don't want to do is just, you know, have right QA is here for face to face classes and face to face health and safety and everything here has a, you know, a QA, but online, oh, that's just something we did during the pandemic and sure, you know, we don't need to worry about it anymore. It is now, as you said, the genie is out of the bottle. It is now part of, of our offering. So I think we need to, we need to really start thinking about that as an industry and we need to say, well, if it is, then What's the best way of doing it? What is best practice? Um, and how can, we, how can we learn to, to incorporate it in in a, really, um, in a way that best you know, suits our students rather than just kind of saying, thank God we don't need to be on Zoom anymore. Or, you know, all of, that, all of those things that we did, we, you know, we, can, we can leave them behind us now, we're, we're back to normal. No, it's, you know, it's, it's only going to become more and more prevalent um, as part of a, you know, a broader kind of learning offering. So, I think we need to embrace that and, you know, why, why, why shouldn't Ireland and, you know, the ELT schools in particular take a lead on best practice in online learning or blended learning if, um, if it's going to form a part of our offering.